Yasha, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me on, Farid. So when you look at what is happening in Europe, um, these waves of migrants, issues regarding growth, the one thing you're beginning to get worried about is democracy itself. Explain why. Yeah, so I think there's this theory that people have that democracy is remarkably stable. So when you look at the history of democracy, there's never been an incident when a country that both has been a democracy for a number of years and has a relatively high standard of living, so a GDP per capita of about $15,000 per year, um, uh, has collapsed. But what we're seeing when we look at some of the recent opinion poll data across the world is that people are actually starting to turn away from democracy in certain ways, across three dimensions. So for example, when you ask people, how important is it to you to live in a democracy? You look at people born in the 1930s, 1940s. They say, over 70% of people say, 10 out of 10. It's absolutely crucial to me to live in a democracy. When you look at people born in the 1980s, the 1990s, here in the United States, it's less than 30% of people who say that. Wow. And is that true of Americans as well? Yeah, that's in that's the United the, States. That's the American that's, number. That's the United and States. And the European data. numbers are the same. And European numbers are very similar. Yeah. And what's your theory as to why? Presumably, these are you know, the people from the older generation mm -hmm. know a world of fascism and communism and therefore see the, the, the democracy as this great alternative. Right. Today's young people have always lived in a world that's been largely democratic. Yeah, I think there's two things going on. So one thing is that people used to know what it means to not live in a democracy, and so that gave them a great attachment to living in a democracy. Um, the ideological appeal of democracy was something very fervent, whereas now we have some theoretical idea that we prefer living in a democracy, but we don't really what it would, know what it would mean no longer to live in a democracy. And the other thing, I think, is just changes in the standard of living. For the first time in US history, the Census Bureau reports that standard of living for average citizens has stagnated for 25, 30 years, and that changes people's perspective. Suddenly, they're saying, whoa, perhaps the establishment is out for themselves. Perhaps they're not actually helping me out. Perhaps my life's not better than my parents' was, and my children's life is going to be even worse. And that makes them very restless and very disenchanted. So, but being disenchanted and restless, does that translate into being a against democracy? Because I think of the United States, you see this mm -hmm. frustration, and it typically takes the form that People in Washington don't understand. People right. don't, you know, get. And you see this in Europe, where it's usually Brussels, the European mm -hmm. Union, which is. But are, are you are you taking too big a leap to say that that therefore is a vote against democracy? Well, I think it's two things at the same time. So one is that again, the data shows very, very clearly that people are getting more open to authoritarian alternatives. So, for example, in 1995, again, in the United States, uh, one in 15 Americans said that they want the army to take over. Today, 20 years on, it's grown to one in six. Wow. And one of the striking things in the data is that it used to be mostly uh, poor people, uneducated people who were open to those kind of authoritarian alternatives, and now often it is the wealthy. So when you look at uh, another question, um, uh, I, w I want a strong leader who can dispense with Congress and elections. 20 years ago, less than 20% of wealthy Americans said they were in favor of this. Today, it's more than 40%. So there's a growing minority of people who are actually open to authoritarian rule. And then I think there's a majority that does want to live in a democracy, that does not want the military to take over, that does not want a strong leader who doesn't have to worry about Congress, but that's getting disenchanted with democracy, that's fallen out of love with democracy. And those two things put together are quite concerning to me. I have to ask you, do you think Trump is a reflection of that, uh, that desire I, I want a strong leader who can dispense with, uh, with, with institutions. Absolutely, and as a strong leader, not as a military leader, but a CEO, right? I think now we're at a stage where people don't trust anybody anymore. And so what they say is, if you come onto the scene and you say, I'm the, the honest politician, by definition, I'm not going to trust you. And Trump doesn't say that, actually. He says, look, I paid for Hillary Clinton to come to my wedding, right? So he's sort of admitting that he's playing a corrupt game and so at least he's authentic. At least the pe people are saying, look, nobody is really honest, but at least Trump has the authenticity to call that out, to not pretend that he's the one who's above the system. And that, I think, is a real sign of how, how disenchanted people have become, how cynical they've become. And, and Trump and Carson, of course, the two frontrunners who together in many of the polls uh, are at 50 or 50 percent, right. are both non-politician outsiders. Yeah, exactly. And who are generally quite authentic. Right. So what is the danger here? Um, is you really worry that you are going to end up with the collapse of democracy in the Western world? 
So I think because of the rise of communism and the Cold War, we still have a tendency to think of systemic alternatives in these very stark terms. Is there going to be a revolution where suddenly everybody wants to copy the Chinese model and we're going to have a putsch and, you know, an American Communist Party is going to be... That's not going to happen. I'm pretty confident that 50 years from now we're going to say that we live in a democracy, we're going to have some form of elections, but my worry is that the substance of democracy is going to erode, that the system is going to be called a democracy, it's going to have elections, but it doesn't look very much like what we have now. What do you think is going to happen in Germany, which has now taken in, or is plans to, and almost certainly will, mm. will fulfill that commitment, to take in eight to 900,000 people this year alone, which is 1% of the German population. Yeah. It would be like the United States taking 300, I mean, uh, you know, three and a half million people in yeah. one year. Um, what happens in this homogenous uh, country that has not, you know, is not used to that? And the short answer is that, that I don't think we know yet. I don't think there's a way of knowing. So um, there really isn't an example historically of uh, what Western Europe has been doing over the last 40 years. So you have countries like uh, the United States that were to some degree founded as multi-ethnic, multicultural countries with immigrants coming from everywhere with obvious restrictions. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Americans never defined themselves by we all lived together for a thousand years in the same world and then we emerged and built a state, right? Um, and then you had sort of multinational empires like the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, where you had different ethnic groups. They sort of lived next to each other rather than together. Now, what you see in Western Europe and in Germany is countries that define themselves in these monocultural, monoethnic terms. We are Germans and we have the same ethnicity and we've lived in the same woods for a thousand years. And now suddenly you have a lot of immigration. You have to redefine yourself in these multicultural, multi-ethnic ways. And I with, think with Germany's... people who did not live in those woods and do not share the same uh, religion, language, culture. Exactly, who are quite different, visibly different often and different in terms of their cultures and so on when they come in. And so the question is, can countries manage to redefine themselves in that way? I think that's an open question, and it's the question of Europe's future. Fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Farid.